This is the same case with Fabs. He is, as all the other uh, great presenters, a beautiful, amazing, intelligent person. And uh, please, an applause to Fabs while he joins me on stage. Hi. Fabs. Yeah, so basically I'm going to be ranting a bit about vulnerabilities in open source software and the disclosure process behind them. Um, I'm sorry about the rant and I'm sorry about my slides. They just came into existence like half an hour ago. So um, I'll do my best, but I'm sorry for that. So um, the title of my talk is Grepping for Shells because most of the stuff I did I found on with grep. It's an awesome tool. Love grep. It's the best, seriously. And uh, apart from that, <laughs> I'm going to talk about, about like how the whole responsible disclosure thing works sometimes, um, especially how that works in open source software and what can go wrong. Um, the software I'm going to talk about as an example here is one I found a bug in. It my, was my first disclosure. So um, I don't really know how the whole thing works, but I'm kind of doing the bit, a bit of storytelling. And uh, the software is used by this kind of weird research lab in uh, Switzerland that does like these shooting little bits at each other. And it's the software that they use to look at uh, the data they're using and how to analyze it and so on. And I, the, this whole, the story starts uh, sometime around Easter when I had a bit of time. And first of all, what's root? It's the software I'll talk about. There was a talk about it on the last C3. Um, something about LHC plus Higgs plus something is equal to something. It was a good talk. Recommend watching it. But yeah, this is m more about the bugs in it. So root, this is the text they use to describe it on their website, where they say it's a framework to look at things and to do things. And, um, but most of all, the thing I found it to be is very specialized software to do special use cases. First of all, you can save data and files. That's very special. The da that data is in tables. And tables have, uh, are called trees in root. I don't know why, but they are. Columns are called branches. And in those uh, columns, you can have rows and, well, or cells and, like, you know, you get the idea. And they're called leaves, not tea leaves. But everything in root starts with a T because it's a type. It's C++. I don't know. And, of course, when you have, like, software that does this kind of stuff, you need an embedded scripting language. So what they did is they put this embedded scripting language in there. It's called C++. And it's interpreted by a Clang thing that uh, was made into a just-in-time compiler called Kling, because it's interactive now. And they do like big data, you know, like they have a lot of these collisions, so there's a lot of things happening, and they need to save it, and it's like you know a lot. So they need to save that stuff, they need to process it. So. There are a few requirements. You need to not have the whole file in memory at one time, because that can be a few terabytes, and that's annoying. Then you, can do, you, ha you have to be able to do like some sort of cluster operations, so they have their own daemon for that. And because you need to like access files over the network, they decided to do um, this thing called implementing their own file server. And you can open files remotely, and the protocol is called root. And it's an awesome file server. You can open files and so on, but I'll come out to that. So they, there's a few services it offers, and some of that is a remote code execution, and some of it is local uh, code execution as a services, and I'll be, this will be three acts because it's a trilogy, you know? Um, first of all, when I look through the documentation, can you read this? Is it too small? Yeah, it is. But Anyways, there's this documentation thing that they have, and it says that you can open files, and when it starts with root, then it's open over the network, over this network server, which I thought, like, cool, let's take a look at that. So yeah, that's a thing. 
Um, it's the service that forwards open, read, write, and so on over the network. And you can open files, and you can every time you read something, it reads a whole block and sends it to you. It's great, really. The service is called is called Rooty. I don't know. On some distributions, it runs as like root, but that's not because it's in the name. Sometimes it doesn't run as a root. And it's deprecated, but still used. So. And the new thing is called xrooty. I don't know. It's because it's better. So rooty, they thought, they thought it's really good to produce shell variables in f file names. And they thought of how do we like do that. So turns out they do it like that. Does anyone see what's wrong with this? Yep, basically, yeah. And then they decided to, to um, fix that by escaping stuff. So this is basically the, the stuff they are doing. And yeah, they're putting echo in front of it. On HPUX, they put spin, no, bin echo in front of it. And they even do like this thing where they escape shell characters to fix that whole thing. So these are the characters they escaped. Um, I don't know why they didn't think of backticks, but yeah. So there was a remote code execution in that. So then they decided, okay, let's. This whole thing is deprecated, anyways. So I looked at the new one because you know they're they're not going to do the same mistake twice, right? So no, they didn't. But I was having fun and I was grep using grep to do things. So I started grepping source codes for like you know Git repositories for popen. Popen is awesome. It opens a shell and gives you like what the shell does. So sometimes they do that. So they decided, you know, XRoot D is cool. It's it's more web scale. You need you can even authenticate with like a lot of users. So they put this LDAP module in it. And they needed to like map users to like the LDAP principle uh, like uh, distinguish names. And grepping for popen finds things. Um, anyone see what's wrong here? It's the same thing as before, pretty much. You can basically just this thing here is the username that you could put in to like do it. The other the other bug was you didn't have to put in your username. Like you had to authenticate first, and then you know put the file name. But here you can just put in your username that contains like quotes. And a semicolon, and there you go. You have a shell. Um, there's a t like another bug there as well, where you know you can put in a long username. It also works. Yeah, and uh, it's it's all fed into popen. Oh, okay, yeah. So episode six. Um, those were the two remote code uh, executions I found. Um, the third, this, the next one was actually in the documentation, so it's actually also worth uh, grabbing documentation for C++ keywords. Um, if you have like C++ things, so the way they they represent a function object, it's like a you know in their scripting language is, you have this thing called a TF1. It's T for type because it's a type, F for function, and one for one dimensional because it's C++, you know. And that can be a lot of things. It can be an expression. Uh, it can be an expression. It can be a lambda expression. So the, if you grab stuff for lambda, sometimes you find things. Um, and the way you use it is you create a new type of this object, and in a string, you put like the C++ code you want to execute. And the cool thing is you can save these things in those root files. You know, you can you can save those in like those trees or branches are next to them or like in histograms that you make. Um, so does anyone know those office macro things? That you know when you when you click like execute when like you know an, you open an office thing from one of those weird emails that want to like send you money? Yeah basically same thing. Because you can put lambda expressions in there. It's even documented. It's as a service, you know. So you can actually put a fun create functions that look like that. It's cool. And um, 
So, you know, you, you start grabbing documentation for, like, you know, shells. You start grabbing, the, um, like, source code for shells, and you find things. And then the next question is, what do you do? I mean, this is, like, software that's running on, like, universities and, and like, research institutes, and, you know, it's not... You, you kind of have some sort of responsibility if you feel like that. And you want to make sure this gets fixed the right way, TM, whatever that is. Um, but you want to make sure this gets fixed without too many people like taking advantage of it. So how do you do that? It's surprisingly difficult, actually, and takes a lot of time. So I started looking around, and I found like there's this, this GitHub repository. And there's like a URL up there. So I clicked that. There's this page, and it says, hey, you know, there's a public key so that you can, like, you know, contact us with if you want to, like, disclose something. I was like, yay, they get it. Cool. By the way, I'm going to show you some emails. I'll only show you emails I wrote or emails that were not uh, encrypted, which are public, therefore, anyways. Um, so I sent them this message. Um, which roughly descripts to like this. Um, I don't really know how the, this uh, disclosure process works, so it said like, hey, I have discovered something there. Those are the things I found. I have some proof concept stuff, and I'd like to like disclose it, and how do I do this? And here's my public key. Feel free to contact me with it. They sent me this email back, which is also encrypted with this weird cipher called HTML. Um, I redacted the name, but it's this person from like that organization. Um, I'll call him like the CERN search guy or something like that. Yeah, and that roughly decrypts to that. Oh no, wait, did I? No, I don't have this decrypted. But yeah, it basically says, like, yeah, thanks for contacting us. If you have a proof of concept, we'd like that. And, um, like, tell us how to do it so we can fix the software and arrange for, like, uh, it to be rolled out. And I was like, yeah, cool. This was, like, a few minutes later. And I was, like, on, on a, like, an Easter day where people are usually, like, you know, not at work in the evening. So, yay. They get it. Ex even though it wasn't like um, encrypted, but yeah, so I sent them this back, and I said like, yeah, I couldn't read your email, um, but maybe send me text plain messages with like your P with like PGP. That's that's cool, but yeah, so that's that, and I gave them some like um, proof of concepts how to like open it, and. Um, I, I suggested a few more things. I don't know if, if it was my place to do this because it, I, I don't know how to do this, but I thought it would be like a good idea to, you know, suggest being kept in the loop or to like ask them to like publish stuff that uh, like a security advisory or something like that so people know to actually fix their stuff and get patched because, you know, fixing software doesn't help if people don't patch it. Um, yeah, I got this thing back, which roughly decrypts to that, which is some ticket system saying, yeah, we have a, we're at it. Um, the fix turns out to be, like, for the, the, the thing, the macro thing, you know, where you, like, have, can open a file and it executes code. Um, it seems to be kind of difficult because executing code is the serv is, like, you know, the purpose. So it's code execution as a service. Yay. And, you know, you shouldn't trust those files. But, yeah, anyways. And that's pretty much the last thing I heard. Then, a while later, I, I you know, updated my, like, you know, git pulls and so on, and uh, found so they fixed it. There is this pull request, and it got merged, and it was cool, cool, cool. That says, like, yeah. Address security uh, threat reported by, and the reported by, I, I redacted the name, you can't see it, but that was that uh, like search guy that I reported the thing to. So, yay for attribution. Um, but the, the good thing is the software got fixed, right? And yeah, 
It says, here someone even, wait. Here someone even like suggests, could someone merge this in? Maybe we should backport it. As in, put it into like an old software. Which is cool, yay. Except it didn't happen, it just got merged. And the other software, the XRT, someone said, yeah, that may become a security threat, so let's not build this LDAP module thing anymore. So it's like, that's cool. At least, you know, no volumes in the code they like ship now. It's like all commented out. So yeah, sorry, that's the end. It's fixed. Really? So yeah, not, not really. So um, the thing is, Getting it fixed is like the beginning of it all, and remo it seems disclosure is like a really like difficult process, and doing it takes time and effort. Um, so it turns out, this is like a screenshot from archive.org, awesome project, they're great, really, they're they're great, um, and it's uh, right like the latest release is at the time where the fix was pushed, and like the latest release like in the was like around then and uh, like version 60904 was the one they they committed the fix in and version 60902 was the one that was the current development branch or like unstable or something like that this was stable people use stable people like stable software they don't like their bugs getting fixed um so and this was like, you know, the old version, the, the really stable one, you know? And I think, yeah, so stuff like that happened. And, it, you know, there's these things called change logs. People don't put things in them that, are, that might look bad for them. So that's also great. So, no, you know, there w the bug was fixed, but no one knew about it, and no one was going to patch their shit. So, yeah, the other thing, XRT did put it in the change log. They said... Do not build package lib xrd sec gsi gmap ldap dot so. Do you would you like update your software if it says that? Would you feel like you had like a bug? Like you know, remote code execution kind of in the username kind of bug. Not really, right? So yeah, I thought you know there's one way to make sure that people get the idea to like patch their stuff if they're not gonna do it. You know, I'll have to. So there's this awesome project called the Distributed Weakness Filing Project. It's kind of starting out um, till now. Every time you want a CVE, it goes through some like um, numbering authority that assigns you a number. And once you get that number and it gets verified, then that gets pushed out to like all the distributions and like loads of people who, you know, see that there is a problem. That's the point of doing these. Um, and sometime in May, June, I don't, unfortunately don't really remember anymore when it, that was exactly, I filled out this Google Docs form, which is the how to get a CVE for open source software. It seems like this is the only project that currently assigns CVE numbers for open source software. Um, that took ages, oops, that's the wrong slide. Then I spent a lot of time waiting. In June, I like pretty pretty like I think it was a month later or something like that I'm not quite sure to be honest um, I got an email to accept some terms of use or like contributor guidelines that I'm that I'm willing to like publish stuff then nothing happened then mid of August I got a notification of assignment that my CVEs got assigned and in sometime in November um, I got an email like here there's a CVE can you like I have no idea, you know, what the problem is because there is like nothing in the release notes. There's nothing by the project itself referring to the problem. So yeah, I, I had to clear that up, and then like they were assigned, so which is cool. And then even later, something it got even better. I just saw this like two hours ago. It's 14 days ago, which is approximately the time those CVE numbers hit the bug trackers, they actually backported the fix. So, yay for them. So it seems like the way to get stuff done is actually to get these weird CVE numbers. Um, otherwise, people don't care. 
And it even, like, that was the slide I was trying to show you here, it even landed in, like, these Debian trackers, which is cool. They decided not to fix it because it's, you know, authenticated code execution, but... And I think the package itself is not supported anymore because no one maintains it. But yeah, that's cool that there is like things and trackers about it. And so yeah, I have like that is till now where I'm at. I don't know if there's still something happening or anything. But the first like I have a few takeaways uh, from it and things I learned through like throughout the process. It's Responsible disclosure is really, really hard. Like, it, it's a lot of work. It's not easy. You have to kick people, and people will not really want you to do that. Some people will, but people don't really want their bugs to be, like, public or whatever. Um, like, one, one takeaway for, like, people who are actually in the business of, like, you know, mitigating exploits and... Uh, or like the whole you know communication stuff. You know the work doesn't end after the bug fix. Arranging for a bug fix isn't the end of it. It has that bug fix still even has to like land in repositories. That bug fix has to land in like the stable branches. It's always nice to credit people who found it and not like you know take the credit yourself. And um, things like the, the distributed weakness filing project, they're awesome. They, they are very necessary. And, you know, they, they, they cause things to, like, work. And without them, things don't work. Because without them, bugs don't get pushed. Like, the, the fixes don't get pushed to, like, out there. And especially, like, in non-IT and scientific communities, like, for example, where you get root, um, Software engineering is difficult for people who don't do it. And people who don't do it end up, you know, not being educated to do it. And so it really helps to, like, have some kind of synergy between people who are in software engineering and in security and other areas, which is, I feel, a bit missing. And, you know, people shouldn't have to make their own tools if, they, if their, like, work isn't really, you know, making them but using them. And, yeah, that's, like, where I'm at. I'd like to thank the Distributed Weakness Failing Project for um, taking care of, like, bugs and doing that st the stuff they do. They're awesome. Um, I'd like to thank CERNCERT for getting the bug fixed. Um, the Root Project for doing that, making that software, because it's actually useful. Um, my CTF team, Tasteless, they're great. The best. Totally, it's true. And that very awesome person who made me look at Root. Are there any questions? The I Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? I can ask a few questions to, to warm you up. Perhaps you promise... Okay, now I'm, I'm first, though. You promised me a talk. If um, these guys wouldn't, don't have the, uh, wouldn't have done the backport yeah. 14 days ago, would you still... Would you have held the talk here anyway? Um, to be honest, I saw that the backport happened like two hours ago, and... <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think publicity is one way to get stuff fixed. Um, and the bug, if the bug is, like, the moment the, the fix landed in, like, a, a pull request, it's kind, of, it's kind of public, you know? People, people know it. People see, people look at the GitHub pull requests for, like, you know, the fixed remote code execution, please merge. Um, yeah, they, those things are out there. And... Um, you know, there's there's a process to like you know fix code and then then publish that there is like a fix out there and please update your stuff, and if that isn't followed, but you know you fix it in like you know master, but you don't fix it in like your stable branch, then I don't know I don't know what to do about that. Uh, well, I don't really see a big difference between code as a service and remote code execution. So why would anyone do this at all? Sorry. I don't really see a big difference between uh, code as a service and remote code execution. Why 
is does this package exist at all? Um, well, it, it's basically it's basically something that works like a database, and it has functions to analyze data. Um, it exists because. People are too lazy to look at the new things and want to use their old stuff that used to work in the 80s. Um, so it's it's legacy, but it's the best there is for the stuff it do it does, which is um, have a lot of classes that do a lot of data analysis and scriptable in C++. Any more questions? So Fabs, um, one last question from my side. I will, I will sit down too. <laughs> this is <laughs> my, the cameraman has uh, awesome fun. Normally, you stay in one height. You don't. You don't. <laughs> you don't move down. <laughs> like the back. Is like, there was a lot of movement. Sorry. Fabs, this was a very interesting talk. And um, if any one of us uh, would like to talk to you about it, how would we do it? How would we get in touch? Maybe questioning. I don't know. If you see me walking around, I'm mostly walking around. So. I don't really have a place I'm sitting here at the moment, um, so there isn't really that much. You can dig out my email from the CVE number that was on the screen, which, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, service as a service. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> okay, um, then um, this concludes the talk held by Fabs. Last uh, applause, please.